Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. I'm very pleased to have a special guest on the show today. It is filmmaker, um, psychologist and world traveller Daniel Mackler. Welcome, Daniel. Hi. <laughs> Thanks so much. Nice, nice, nice to be here. Great to have you. Thanks so much for, for coming on the show. You, you are back in New York now, is that right? Yes. I've been here for about three days. Awesome. Have you, over, have you got over your jet lag yet from, from all of your European travels? Well, I was surprised. I didn't actually have almost any jet lag at all. It was not noticeable. Because I was staying with people who were staying up until 3 o'clock in the morning every night. And the last stop was Norway. And I got back to New York and I just started going to bed at 9 o'clock at night. So really, <laughs> it really was, there was no adjustment. You were, on, just, you were on American time over there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I thought if I stay up late, it's really smart. I was staying up and sleeping until noon every day. And awesome. So, so it was the same when I got back. Well, well thanks so much for agreeing to, uh, to have this chat. And, and just to give you the background... So The Voluntary Life is about ways of finding freedom in an unfree world. Okay. And we've talked about lots of practical issues like, for example, unschooling. Um, yeah. And we've talked about entrepreneurship and unjobbing. And we've talked about traveling and living, um, working abroad. And so lots, lots of different ways of getting as much personal freedom as, as possible. Yep. But one of the aspects that, you know, that is, I think, a really important aspect of, of freedom is, is not just these, um, these practical changes that you can make um, in your life, but it's also the, the question of psychological freedom. And so I thought it would be interesting to talk to you about what your thoughts are on, you know, what psychological freedom actually means and, and what it means to, to get more freedom into your life. So I, I guess I wanted to start off um, by um, by asking you, you know, wh what do you think of as psychological freedom? Oh, well, the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of what is psychological freedom is to be free of traumas, right. to have resolved one's inner traumas, and then that liberates one's own true self within. And then actually the person then has the power of free will to do what you want and to do, to be who you really are, as opposed to be hampered by traumas, to be hampered by, um, I would use the word introjects, but people from your past that have actually implanted themselves in your head. And those old voices and those old people in your head are still controlling you like a puppet. So when they're gone, when the traumas that they have implanted are gone, then you get yourself Right. I mean, that, that I think, um, fits very nicely with you know, one of the, the descriptions of freedom that um, one of the books that we talked about on the show is by a guy called Harry Brown. And he described freedom, he was thinking very much in, in sort of practical sense. He described freedom as being able to live the, your life the way you want to live it, not the way that other people think that you should live it. And what you've, right. just, what you've just described in terms of these, you know, interjects or voices that get left, left inside your head is like you know in that sense the freedom is to be free to live the way that life that that you want to as opposed to these sort of leftover voices from from your history think that you ought to live is, is that a, a fair way of, of describing it yes it's i mean i think it's in a way a bit more complex than i described it because also a lot of people think they're living the life that they want, but they're not even aware that all this other stuff is going on inside of them. So they, when I use the word true self, your true self gets liberated when your traumas get liberated. People who aren't really even aware how much of their past history is implanted in their head and how many traumas they have left unresolved, they can actually feel like a self. They can feel like they're doing what they're, they want, but really they're, they're being guided and manipulated by all these forces that they're not even aware of. And in reality, they're living like a, like a shell of a self. Right. And, and so they might say, this is what makes me happy. This is what I do, but it's really not even their true self that they're operating through. Well, that is fascinating because the question that then sort of immediately comes, comes up from that is, you know, if you have uh, these thoughts or desires or wishes or, or perspectives, how do you know? Um, what is your true self talking and what is, you know, one of these 
interjects that you that you describe mm. talking yeah well it's such a tough question how it's how do i know i mean i could answer that as a personal question how do i know is because i can feel the difference and i i think there was always some part of me that remained true and i always just had some little radar inside of me some compass that told me that part of me is real the other part of me was it was confused. I wasn't quite sure what it was. I was, it had a lot of influence over my life, but there was always a part of me that I just knew was really me. And as I've grown and developed as a person, that part of me that really was me has just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And I've become much more clear at seeing the part of me that's really not me right. and, and working it out. But basically, the way, so the general answer I have is how do I know what really is me and how do I know what isn't is I look within and I really just go within and like a homing pigeon connect to that part of me that just somehow just feels incredibly qualitatively different. And I know some people that don't really have an ability to do that. And I know some people who have an extremely rudimentary ability to do that. And if you have a rudimentary ability to do that, that's a good place to start with starting with connecting who that real person is within and then developing it and using that as sort of um, a contrast between the other parts that are not really the true self. But with people who really don't have much of that ability or have no ability at all to connect with the true self, it, it actually is very, very hard. And I think most people actually don't have much of an ability at all. That's just my impression by watching people in the world. Right, right. And that's why a lot of people, I think, are so unfree. They're so absolutely unfree. And they, they really don't believe in things like free will because they really don't have any. Right. Yeah, I think I, I understand what you're saying. And, and uh, it strikes me that um, you described in the beginning how a lot of people um, – well, basically take it for granted that, yeah, this is what I love, this is what I do, these are the things that, that, are, that make up me, this is my personality, um, without um, any, um, any introspection or any internal um, sort of dialogue about, hang on, I, I feel one thing, but then again, I, I also feel a different thing, what, what's going on, and, and, and any sort of internal, I suppose, I'm not sure if conflict is the right word there, but it strikes me that the the thing that you do um, sense if you sense a difference between your authentic self and your and your false selves for want of a better word is that there's going to be a conflict between those two things internally that you presumably are going to be able to also pick up on at, at some level if you if you are open to it is is that right I think it basically sounds right. I mean, it's it's very difficult to describe this or talk about it. And I also don't know exactly who's who would be listening to this podcast. So it's it's complicated to know exactly the language to frame it in and how much I can assume. Mm. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I'm not sure either. Is I, I, I think that um, a lot of the people listening to this podcast – may have heard some other things on Free Domain Radio and other places like that. So there, there will be people who will be familiar with some of the sort of um, psychological freedom ideas. Um, but there may also be people who, who have taken interest because of entrepreneurship and, and other ways of being free. I guess it's safe to assume that the people listening, if, they are, if they've chosen to listen to this one, that they're at least that they will have an interest in, yeah, I, I would like to, 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 to have a sense of psychological freedom but i they may not have that much experience of of sort of what, what it means to go about um uh looking for that i can tell you for example that i say about six years ago that's exactly the position that i would have been in i would have been interested but i would have spent a long I, but i had at that point spent a long time focusing on external things and not on introspection and it was a very sort of uh, new um, new step for me to take to, to look at that, which is one of the reasons why I thought this would be, uh, you know, it would be good to talk to you from the, to give people who maybe are starting out on that journey some pointers at least as to, you know, as to where they might go. Right. It's pretty tough. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, people really have to want it and they have to want to look within. It's, it's really a solo journey in a lot of ways. I mean, I don't think, I mean, someone can mirror a person's true self, but from the outside, but in my experience also, when people who are really pretty blissfully unaware of who they are on the inside get their true self mirrored, a lot of times they don't like it. It's not a very pleasant process. Right. Yeah. And, and it, a, lot, a lot comes with it. It's a, uh, so it takes it takes a real strong personal motivation, I think, to want to connect with one's true self because it's a hell of a journey to go on. I, I haven't I've experienced it as incredibly liberating for me, but also the path of liberation is extremely painful to rid rid myself of those other parts of me that really weren't me and were thrust upon me or shoved inside of me through through abuse, neglect, horror, trauma. Right. Even really mild stuff. Now, when you say to rid yourself of that, I mean, um, can you describe your experience of, you know, what does it mean to, you, you talked about being, you know, identifying that part of yourself that is really you and other parts of yourself that, you know, are sort of little leftover characters that have been implanted from past um, traumas and, and relationships and, and and things that you you know that, that you experience, you know, what is it? What does it mean to rid yourself of that? What does that actually look like? Well, the word that comes to mind is to grieve those parts, right? To grieve what was lost as a result of having those parts in one. Um, to heal, it's like, I guess it's almost like, what would it be like having a a parasite lays its eggs under your skin and it grows under your skin and it, it, it inflames your arm and it becomes part of your arm in a way. And then it's like that part, it's not just, ooh, remove it, you feel better. It's like it's like all intertwined through the blood vessels. So it's really like growing through it, taking it out, um, being very weak perhaps for a while, suffering, having a lot of pain, but slowly healing it and getting the use of your arm back and then having to do sort of physical therapy to get your arm to work properly again. Right. I mean, that's just an analogy, but I think a lot of it, I mean, it's, it's an emotional process. It's an intellectual process of understanding what's going on. It's connecting to other people who can understand this. So you don't feel totally socially isolated. Um, being very gentle with oneself for me, loving myself, treating myself well, eating well, exercising nicely, getting a good night's sleep every night, doing productive things during the day, and really doing a lot of inner work for me. That's been a big part of my process. A lot of uh, looking inside myself, being honest with myself, having honest conversations with myself, doing a lot of journaling, looking at my dreams, all, all of the studying from many different angles, what is going on inside of me, giving a lot of support to myself throughout the process of growing and changing and growing out of a lot of traumas that have been internalized. Mm. So, and it's also part of it is the more I've changed, the more I have in a lot of ways become quite alienated and differentiated from quote normal people. And that in one way has been very painful because at some level, it's very nice to be part of a social group. And it's very painful to be alienated from a social group. But in another sense, part of my liberation has been to become connected with myself and to find an incredible richness in that and to realize I don't really want to be a part of the norm if the norm is so incredibly screwed up. And, and yet at the same time, it's like I still need human connection, and I think everybody does. And the more we connect with who we really are on the inside – I think the more we want to share it and the more we have to offer. And so there's a very painful tug in becoming liberated and becoming, or I should say becoming more liberated because I'm not fully liberated. I still have a lot of work ahead of me. Right. Yeah. The, the, I mean, the image that comes to mind for me when you talk about sort of the difficulty of um, becoming more authentic, but then, doing that within a context of people around you who have their own traumas that they haven't worked through and their own sort of fantasies 
you know, it's it's sort of a bit like growing up in a fundamentalist religious um, sect or, or cult or, or whatever, and and then you know realizing the myths that everybody is um, you know is, is perpetuating and teaching their children and stuff, and realizing how damaging those all of those um, sort of uh, barbaric ideas are. But right. still, but still living in that fundamentalist town, you know. Yeah. Uh, and in some ways, you know, that that religion metaphor, I mean, that applies to so many things, to so many yeah. sort of shared shared fantasies that that we still um, have around us. Whether it's to do with you know nationalism or um, sort of patriotism and gender um, sort of gender roles and and yes. political activism and so forth. And I mean, I wondered, you know, is is that is that when you look at um, when you look around you and and at our culture in the West today, are these the kind of shared traumas that you this, that you see as being most pervasive, or is it more personal things that you see um, as being sort of the, the things around you that that make it difficult to uh, for people who do want to be authentic to to connect with others? Well, I guess societal traumas or personal traumas is that how you were differentiating the two i wasn't quite sure what you meant yeah i guess what i was saying was you, what i was asking was you were saying you know it's tricky because you want to be authentic but then again you look at the people around you and uh, they got serious uh, unprocessed traumas that they're you know that they haven't worked through and what i was i guess what i was asking is what what comes to mind for you when you uh, talk, when you talk about that are you thinking about sort of like uh you know things that might be more widespread or are you thinking about everyone having their own very specific personal traumas. Hmm. Well, I think it's both. I guess that's why it jumped out at me. Mm. I guess the, uh, the other interesting thing, it, it jumped at what you said first. So I'm going back a, a minute or so, and what you said was you were saying it's um, using an, an analogy of uh, being part of a fundamentalist cult yeah. and growing up that way. And the, the answer I was going to have to that, the response I was going to have was, to me, that's not an analogy. That's actually reality. Right. That's it's, it's it, every. I, that's all I see it is a big, huge fundamentalist cult, and to me, that's. I, I mean, I've written about this a lot. You probably know, you've heard me say stuff about it. But it's to me, that's what the family system is. When there is some unprocessed trauma in parents, they actually are raising their children in a fundamentalist cult, and that's that's the the, the basis of of all those things you were talking about. That is the basis of the fundamentalist religions. That's the basis of countries. That's the basis of society. That's the basis of cultures. Is The building blocks are those families. And that's where the children are welcomed into the world. That's the primary society of a child, is the world that his parents create, the little family systems. And, and that's why I'm just against people having children until they've worked out all their traumas because otherwise they actually are raising their child in a cult to the degree that they have not worked out their traumas. And to the degree that they have worked out their traumas, they're actually raising their child in a free, liberated way. Right, right. So in what you're and, – and this is great because this sort of brings us on to, the, I guess, the, the root of, of all of these things that we're talking about in terms of the way that you're, the way that you're explaining this is that – if you, just to, to mirror back what you're saying, and you can tell me if this is right, but it's to see uh, the world around us and all of the people around us, all of us, as being people who've grown up within, you know, millions of overlapping little cults, basically. And those cults are families where parents are raising children without having overcome their own traumas and therefore sort of basically re-inflicting things on, on their kids. Is, is that yeah. basically the way, of, uh, the way that, that, uh, that you see this? Working? Yeah, Every, everything you said I would agree with, and I would take out two words. You said the word basically twice. Right. I would take out the word basically both times. It's <laughs> spot on exactly what's happening. Yeah. Right, right. So how did you – how is it that, um, that you think you were able to uh, – attain a level of perspective outside your own family cult? Uh, through 
a burgeoning sense of awareness, a sense, uh, basically through honoring my, my feelings. And my feelings were like, something fucked up's going on here, and it stinks, when I was pretty young. And, and yet also seeing that I was beginning to, in various ways, act stuff out that a healthy person wouldn't do. And really, it made me question myself, why am I doing this stuff? And realizing that I was really just, repeating in various ways in various metaphorical ways and sometimes not so metaphorical ways what had been done to me and i just started with this feeling that i have to figure out what the hell's going wrong with me i want to be happier and healthier and more mature and i want to wake up in the morning and feel good about myself and so i really just started a massive process of self-exploration about 20 years ago and for me it started with journaling that was the first place that i really found someone who could hear me and understand me and i could be safe to really just open up and tell what was going on and that person who heard me was me right because i didn't have anybody who could really listen i had some people who could listen to little bits and pieces but and then i started traveling i started getting far away from my family i went to university you know an eight hour drive away and i started going abroad I started hitchhiking. Uh, I started meeting people who were thought differently. I, I started meeting people who respected me more for who I was. I started finding that the world didn't always respond to me in the way that my parents had and my, you know, my other family members had. And all of this sort of snowballed over time. And then a lot of times I went back to my family and I became close to them and I studied them and I interacted a lot with them and found out their histories and also just watched about how I felt when I was around them. And so it was just a huge process of self-exploration, self-evaluation, self-analysis, and seeing, trying to come up with patterns of what was going on. And all sort of the compass for me was, again, my feelings. And over time, it was sort of like this massive sketch started to come out. And the sketch pointed out that my family was really sick. They really didn't treat me very well. They didn't really love me. I loved myself a lot more than they loved me. I respected myself a lot more than they respected me. In many ways, they wanted me to be small. They didn't like it when I became more radical. They didn't want me to be outspoken. Uh, there was a lot of double talk, a lot of lies. Um, and, and that I just felt better when I was farther away from them. And when I went back, it was a lot like what motivated me to go back a lot was guilt and desperation, um, false hope, fantasy that they would change. I tried a lot to change them, failed, failed miserably, failed miserably again, failed miserably again, wrote about it, explored it. And then by the time I was in my late twenties, I found it started finding people who, when I spoke, I wasn't getting the response I got from 99.999% of people I knew and from 100% of the people in my family. I started finding people who, when I spoke and I talked about what was going on in me, they said, oh, yeah, you're right. That makes total sense. And then they could explain to me back exactly why what I was saying had an internal emotional logic to it. And suddenly I was started getting mirrored from outside people. And then I started realizing, oh, yeah, that really thrust me forward on my process much more quickly. It gave me a lot more motivation because I suddenly started finding friends. I'd never really had true friends before that because people weren't really seeing me for who I was. So the people I was friends with were more friends with my false self than my true self. And then I did a huge amount more journaling. I still do it. I did a lot of dream analysis, um, spending a lot of time alone meditating, spending a lot of time being with people who really liked me. I also became financially independent, created a career as a therapist, worked really hard, uh, was useful to people, felt productive in my work. Uh, and all in all, it was just a question of becoming much more of a mature, independent adult on all levels. Does that, does that, that do you follow it? Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to, I was going to say, I think that, you know, the, the, the way that you describe your, your feelings about your relationship with your family is something that I, I'm sure a lot of people can totally relate to. And I yeah. think it's really, really helpful to, to hear about that process and, and hear about the thoughts and, and even, yeah. you know, some of the, some of the sort of you know, experiences that you had in terms of journaling and traveling and dream analysis and stuff, I think yeah. it's useful for people to know that, 
you know that's that's the sort of thing that that, that, that has been helpful to you in terms of, of giving you um, that perspective. Yep. And one other thing that just popped out when you said that is the more I, that I, I reminded about my family, the healthier I've gotten, the nastier they've gotten toward me. The, the more the more they've actually disliked me and been cruel to me. And so it's been, in, in a way, the healthier I got, it really snowballed me in terms of getting out of my family because they weren't like, oh, my God, Daniel's becoming a healthier person. We love him so much more. It was much more like Daniel's changing. He's becoming awful. He's becoming rotten. He's becoming disrespectful. Fuck him. He's, he's actually denying our, the validity of our experience. He has less empathy. He was better when he was 12 years old. You know, he, he, it's like this new person has taken him over, and we don't like him. And, and it was like, for me, that was the feedback I was getting, while at the same time I was getting feedback from really healthy, mature people saying, oh, my God, you're awesome. You're becoming so much healthier. And it was like, wait a second. These healthy people are saying one thing. My family's telling me I'm more fucked up than ever. They were starting to say stuff like I was bordering on mental illness. And it's like, to me, that feedback really helped me to realize, get the hell away from these toxic people. They want to kill you. They, and they always did. It's just that when you've become louder and stronger and more clear about who you are, now it's like it's no longer a covert, passive-aggressive war because that doesn't work for them anymore. Now they have to be open and aggressive and hate your guts publicly. Right, right. And I mean, the, the thought that comes to mind for me when you say that uh, is, you know, coming back to what we were talking about earlier with every, every family um, with trauma, unprocessed trauma in it being like a little fundamentalist religion. What, what comes to mind is that, you know, you are then, because you are, if you do start to become more authentic, then just like an atheist within a fundamentalist religion, you know, you become very disruptive to that little family system because mm -hmm. you are then sort of like sticking out like a sore thumb saying this is all fantasy and is all based not, not on people being authentic. And that becomes a challenge, which so I think this is probably a shared experience, certainly was for me, and I think it's probably a shared experience for a lot of people that if you do change in terms of your you know, your own self-growth and looking at your, your, yourself and trying to get to that authentic part of you and reassessing your, yourself, your relationships, your history, then that becomes incredibly challenging for people who have known the false you that used to fit in. And, yep. and I think that's another, you said it's a tough process. And I think that's another reason why it is a tough process because not only is it tough for oneself, but you get a hell of a lot of pushback from people who don't want to hear you talk about <clears throat> your authentic experience. Very much. And I also would say, uh, and they're going to hate it if you start becoming true. I would, I would even go so far as to say they, uh, they don't like you being a true self. They, they like you being a false self, right. meaning, but, but deep down, they actually created that false self in you and they required it for you to participate in the family. Right. So it's like that, that's, the you that they created. And if you start to rebel against that, it's like, that's, that's heresy. Right. Right. Yeah. I think that's, um, that's a, a really helpful way of, uh, explaining your, you know, your experience, I think is a very helpful way of explaining the sort of, um, uh, the thing that, that people may, may face if they, if they, you know, if they really are interested in, in this kind of journey. But I do want to come back to that second question, which was that, you know, some of the things, even in our culture, like real um, hardcore uh, physical abuse and sexual abuse, some people can think like, oh, yeah, well, that's actually, I mean, that's really abusive what parents do there. Um, but there are, you know, but that is, you know, just one end of, of a, you know, a spectrum of other types of abuse basically that can have a very long lasting impact and for people who are interested in in getting to you know in having more psychological freedom themselves you know what would you say uh, here's a, i guess here's the way of putting it what would you say to the argument which which someone could present which is like well you know i mean i wasn't like i i don't think i was sexually abused when i was a kid i don't remember any of that yeah i wasn't happy but um you know, I don't remember being, you know, beaten with a belt or something. So I guess right. th that's not really, I guess my parents didn't really abuse me. Yep. Uh, 
Yeah, well, the extreme abusive stuff that gets conventionally or psychiatrically labeled as trauma is what I consider to be, that's the little part of the 1% of the iceberg that sticks above the water. But 99% of the iceberg is below the water. And and what? And so your question is, well, what the hell is that other 99%? Yeah. And to me, well, it, like what causes it is a parent's own unresolved traumas where they're not actually mirroring the child's true self and they're mirroring false stuff and they don't even know that they're doing it and it can take a million different ways it's parents who don't really love their children they not with like really nurturing the child's needs they're actually they've had children for selfish reasons to take from the child and it's it can be very very subtle but it's when the child's needs are not really being met in any mild way. And a parent who's partially traumatized is going to be partially unable to meet the child's true needs. And so how does it play out specifically? It's like, it could happen in a million ways. I mean, I, it's probably easiest for me to just sit here and go into my own history, but basically it's all that I see, mm. or it's a huge amount. I think it's incredibly confusing for children who have grown up with parents who present themselves as extremely healthy to actually figure out, especially in a society where the, those parents are actually better than the average, to figure out where their parents really were screwed up and where they are traumatized. Do, do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, I think I get it. So, so basically what you're saying is that, you know, if you have parents who are not that bad, let's say, relative to the societal norm, not relative to any absolute um, values, exactly. so just relative to the norm. If you have parents who are not that bad, relative or who parents who are, who are excellent compared right, to the, right. the norm. What you're saying is, how is that kid supposed to evaluate the the things that didn't feel good to them? Because their parents, you know, relative to what they see in other families, and also given what their parents are saying about their parenting, is that it makes the kid then it, it makes it hard for the kid to to assess their own experience. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. But they'll they'll pick it up that to some degree. Their purpose is to be there to meet their mother's needs. And that, for a child, is a trauma. Wherever the child has to meet the needs of the parent, whatever those needs are, is, it's screwing up the kid. And the kid has to divorce himself for his own or her own needs in order to meet the needs of the parent. And that, the position of going through that is traumatic. And so I think there's a lot of things that go on out there that that gets labeled as normal for children, but it actually is a real expression of their rage and their trauma. Things like the terrible twos. Oh, kids naturally go through a lot of separation stuff and they learn they need to say no a lot. And they become extremely difficult when they don't get what they want. They, you know, they tantrum. I just see it as so common that to the point that I've actually never seen an example that, that rejects what I've, you know, um, these theories that I've come up with from my observations and I'd like to see one. What I get from what you're saying is basically that, that any time parents have got a, uh, a need themselves, which is about them, you know, like I want to be seen as a great mum because I want people to admire me. Um, you know, I want to be seen as a great dad because I'm a provider or whatever. Whatever these little, you know, needs or roles or concepts or whatever they are that the parents have got, which is about their needs... Their unresolved needs from their own childhood. Right, right. And those things come from their own childhood. That what they're doing, right, even if it's in a subtle way and it doesn't involve beating or something like that, but what they're doing is they are telling the children, you know, I don't really love you. I, I need you to to be part of this thing that I've got going, which is about being a great parent or it's about yeah. being an authority figure or it might be about any of these things, right? But but that's the sort of message that, uh, you know, from from what I from what you're saying, the, the, the kids basically pick up that that's what this is all about, right? That they are, in a sense, they have a bit part in somebody else's drama that they are supposed to fill, you know, this hole as opposed to them being being given you know the opportunity to grow and become who they who they are not right yeah that's exactly it right. and I, I would agree with everything is especially if you take the word basically out <laughs> 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 that, that yeah, yeah to me it's 
It's parents who had unresolved needs from their own childhood. Their parents didn't meet their needs. They grow up. Those unresolved needs are still inside of them. There's a desperation for them to come out. And it comes out through power dynamics when they have control over someone else. They can get someone else to be there to meet their needs. And when people have children, it's the ultimate opportunity of an, uh, for, parent, for a person to have complete control over someone else's life. This person, this little unformed being is full of desperation and need. This little baby will basically do anything to get that parent to love him or her. And that puts the parent in a position of radical control where unconsciously they can start to act out their own unresolved childhood needs on their child. And so basically they can make their little baby child become the parent that they always wished they'd had. And they can unconsciously want that child to, to parent them and to love them. So in, in effect, the river starts to flow backwards. Instead, the river, instead of the river of love flowing from the parent to the child, secretly, the river of love is flowing from the child into the parent, to the point that in our society, I, I mean, I see it all the time, and in, in other societies, people saying, you'll never know what it's like until you have children. You've never known what it's like to be loved that much. Right. You want to know unconditional love? Have a child. And it's like, to me, that's like, that's completely fucked up. Right. It's like, no, this child doesn't love you. This child needs you. And they, the people that don't see the difference don't really understand what mature love and immature love is. Right, right. So. Yeah, that, I think that's extremely clear. And, and so, you know, just to pull this through to, to, the, to the point where we're talking about, you know, again, you know, to use your examples, you were in, in your late teens, early 20s when you came to reassess all of this then, you know, you and other people who may be on that journey, you then, did you then start to understand that that, that was what had happened to you in your family? Or did it come a lot later that you came to really be able to, to understand that more consciously? Uh, sort of all of the above. I think I started to figure it out, and it's just like realizing it better and better and better. And then after a while, it becomes like... I knew it early on, and then I knew it better during the middle, and I know it a lot better now, and presumably someday I'll know it even better. Mm. And it's, uh, it's, all this is, I don't know. So, yeah, you want to go on? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I wanted to say that, you know, it's, at least my experience, and th this comes to mind from, in, in the response to, from the response that you just gave, right? My experience is also that, um, coming to understand this stuff. Uh, when I started on, on uh, you know, go, doing introspection and journaling and, and all of these kinds of things, I thought that there would be this, like, ding, light bulb, aha moment. Like, oh, Ooh. that's what my, you know, that was what was happening to me. That's what my issues were about. This is what, you know, and then, you know, I would be psychologically free, right? And that there would be this, like, you know, you do, do the self-work, right? And then you're, that's it. You sort of, you know, you kind of, you, you kind of have that uh, eureka moment. And I, I just wanted to sort of say that from, from what you've just said, and I think this is uh, an experience that people do have, is that psychological freedom doesn't really happen in single eureka moments like that. It's a long process. And sometimes uh, it seems to, you know, the focus seems to get better and then maybe get a little bit worse again and then get better again. You, you sometimes, at least my experience is I had to, I've had to really relearn stuff, uh, not, you know, not just once, but actually it's taken time for, for some of this stuff to, to uh, well, sink in for want of a better uh, way of putting it. Is, yep. is, that, is that fair, do you think? No, yeah, I think that, that that's how my experience has been also. It's relearning stuff, making a lot of mistakes, trying out. And the other thing is a lot of these answers I've come to, like, like people could say scientifically, oh, this is what you wanted to find, so these are the answers you came to because really you weren't doing real experimentation. You, you needed to find this, and this is what you found. Do you follow what I'm yes, saying? Yeah. So in other words, you were just looking to validate your own prejudices. Uh, you, right. For example, let's say you just decided that you didn't like your, your parents, so you went and looked out for, you know, what, what can I find that would validate me um, thinking that as opposed to, uh, right. you know. And, and uh, another one that I hear is, Oh, you just want to blame all your problems on somebody else uh, rather yeah. than take responsibility for your life. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, how would you answer those two? 
Well, the first thing is, so the question is, have I been scientific in my explorations and therefore are my conclusions even remotely valid? Mm. I would say, my God, anyone who says that about me thinking that I was going into this, looking to find this, totally misses the point. I went into this whole subject desperately hoping to find that I was loved, that my parents really cared about me, that I had an awesome childhood. I, I didn't want to separate from my family. I wanted, I wanted them to love me. I wanted to believe that my childhood was great. Mm. I wanted to believe that I was really a fully healthy, happy, mature person. And it's like the conclusions I came up with were not what I wanted. And it's like the only problem was the more I explored honestly and had the strength to look at the answers honestly, the more I thought my childhood is really fucked up. My parents are really fucked up. Their parents were even more fucked up. And I'm really fucked up. And it's like, this sucks. Mm. So, so it's like, in a way, to me, that makes my conclusions to me even more valid because I, this is not what I even wanted to find. And when I look out into the world, it's like when I just see this all around, I mean, the, the, really the hardest one was to see it in my own family. It's much easier to see it in other people, yeah. to see how fucked up my parents were, the horrible things that they did to me because I felt absolutely rotten. Who the hell wants to see this stuff? And to realize, and then also to realize, oh, my God. I'm pretty traumatized and this is it's not it's not fun stuff to come to i can really understand why people go i had a great childhood and it wasn't so bad and i'm pretty healthy and i'm ready to be in a nice relationship and have kids and i'll be a pretty good parent and you know i'll do well by my kids it's like golly that would sure be nice to feel that and to me it's like there's there's a real comfort in being in denial mm. and for me it's just for whatever reason on my path i haven't I don't know, maybe it's something just characterological about me, but I just haven't had that much liberty to be in all that much denial. And it's, it's, been, it's been like more painful for me to be in denial than it is to be real. Being real kind of sucks, but being in denial sucks a lot worse for me. Mm. And so the second part of what you said was, I think it was, uh, you know, another one that, um, that comes to mind is like, um, Oh yeah, I'll, I'll phrase it in these terms. Like, you know, um, you're just trying to blame your own difficulties with happiness in your life on other people, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, and you're not taking responsibility, right? You're not taking responsibility. Nobody can force you to feel anything. You're, you know, you, you you're in control of your life, and all you're trying yeah. to do is just blame your unhappiness on other people, like your family, right? The, the, whoever says that's an idiot, because <laughs> if they're saying. You, no one can make you feel anything. Well, pardon my French, but let's use an extreme example. I've talked to a lot of people who have been raped by their fathers when they were a kid. If you're going to tell them that that can't make you feel horrible, then those people have no understanding of psychology. Actually, everybody who gets raped by their father feels horrible. It's just kind of standard way people are. That's how we're built. Mm. And so... The idea that you can't blame him. They also don't understand, even in these extreme cases, how to recover from trauma. Part of, part of the recovery process is to be furious, is to blame. Is to, and what blame is, is to lay responsibility for the problem on somebody else. That father is responsible for raping his child. He did it. He's responsible. And it's okay for me to not forgive him and to be pissed off at him. On the other hand, it's not his responsibility to heal me. So to me, it's a difference between the cause, who's causing it, and, and putting the blame and responsibility there. That's totally appropriate. But if I'm expecting that father to heal me or my parents to heal me for the traumas that they did, then I'm chasing after a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Right, and right. the real thing is part of being an adult is it's my responsibility to, take, to be at the helm of my own healing and to take the responsibility for my own healing. And, and so there's, there's a validity in that, but that, to me, that doesn't contradict blaming them or having them say, fuck them. They were responsible for causing my problems, which I sort of reduced to a pithy little statement. They caught, they broke it. You fix it. I think that is really helpful because I think that, you know, that, that really makes it clear that, um, that there is a difference between saying, yeah. The blame lies with the people responsible and the adults who decided to have kids, they have responsibility 
for looking after those kids and not traumatizing them. And if they do traumatize them, they have the responsibility for what they've done. But I understand exactly what you're saying, that, that to then try and go back to your, your family to get them to heal you for the things that they did is, is really chasing a dream because, uh, you know, and not, no, that's not even a right word way of putting it. It's yeah, 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 go chase, for it. It's chasing a, a fantasy because, um, because you have to heal yourself and you can't expect somebody who was responsible for traumatizing you to have the responsibility to also, you know, make you whole again. And it's just, it, it, you know, they're actually the, 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 the cause of the problem. So I think the, the distinction you make between where to put the blame and where to put the cause, but also the responsibility that we do have to take to heal ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's basically the, the part of, of, of being an adult. Yep. Um, I think that's really helpful. Yep. So it's, they broke it, you fix it. Yeah, absolutely. And so the, the idea of... Um... Why, why do people get confused with this? Oh, you're just blaming. All you do is blame. You want them to take responsibility for everything. When somebody says that, the first thing is they're, they're making it pretty clear that they have no idea about healing stuff. They have no experience with healing their traumas because right away they're looking at it as, oh, you're blaming them. Therefore, it's their job to fix it. And the only thing they know is either that or they never did anything wrong to me. They're fine. No one is responsible for my feelings and I'm responsible for everything. And it's like, that's equally just foolish. Mm. And it's like, it's, I mean, for me, it's been, and for everybody I've seen who's done any healing from their traumas, part of the process is looking at the people who did it and saying they did it. That's what happened. That's the reality. Those people did some fucking horrible shit to me that I didn't deserve, and fuck them. Mm. And there's reasons they did it. I mean, I certainly can look at my parents. I can say my parents are fucking assholes for what they did to me. Fucking assholes. Fuck them. On the other hand, I've studied my parents' history in exhaustive detail to the point that, I mean, I've inter even interviewed my grandparents. Right. You know, I got to sit with my grandparents and ask them about what, happened to them in their childhoods. And I get to see that, yes, it's an intergenerational problem that goes all the way back. Yes, my grandparents had more difficult childhoods than my parents did. Yes, my grandparents really fucked up my, my, my parents. Mm. And yes, my parents did it to me too. But that doesn't absolve anybody from responsibility. My grandparents are still to bl be blamed for what they did as adults. And so are my parents. Mm. And and, and part of my healing process is just to acknowledge that I'm not at all at fault for what happened to me. They are. Absolutely. I think that's really helpful. That's brilliant. Well, the last thing that I wanted to, to ask you was, and this, I guess, you know, I was thinking about your experience um, in, in the films that you've been doing and the work that you've been doing over the last year or so, because I know that you've been working on uh, basically looking at all the programs out there that are non-drug related um, uh, well basically curing uh, people who've been diagnosed with schizophrenia is that a, is that a fair way of describing the, the programs that you've been uh, looking at yeah um, I would agree with pretty much everything you say some of them are use a little bit of drugs and the other thing I would Take out the word basically again. <laughs> because they do. They, I mean, curing is a complicated thing in psychology because does one person cure another or does the person heal themselves? Right. I would say more, more the therapists or the programs are giving people an, an environment and social interactions that allow people to they, – they actually, they're environments that really facilitate people's own natural spontaneous healing process. Right. Not not they are curing the yes. other person. Yeah, that makes total but sense. They everything give, else, yeah. everything else, I would agree with what you said. Yes, yeah, so they give them an environment to heal, and I guess the the thing that the thought that comes to mind is that we were talking about psychological freedom, and we talked about you know the um, the sort of internal parts of yourself that have been really left over from past trauma, and mm. being able to differentiate oneself from those parts. And, you know, people who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, you know, I think it's, it's a, a very interesting sort of case of, uh, of people who, who have sometimes quite profound breaks with uh, reality around them. That's but, the definition of schizophrenia. Yeah. Right, right. Always have it. Right. And, 
I wanted to ask, you know, is, is there something that you can say in terms of things that can be learned from what happens to the process of schizophrenics healing, uh, their trauma and their sort of profound break with reality and the more subtle, you know, more subtle uh, fantasies or false parts of, our, of ourselves that maybe all of us have? Like, is there a spectrum and can you learn anything yeah. from these dramatic cases? Yeah. I think that's a good question. I mean, the funny thing is, it's like I put a lot of energy into the psychosis, schizophrenia, healing thing, but at basic, it's actually not that complicated. It's just what's interesting about it is it, it really is just way off the charts in the extreme end of the spectrum. It's considered the most severe mental problem you can have to be psychotic or schizophrenic. Right. So to, I think to cover the bases with psychosis, part of why it's fun for me is if you show that people can get fully well without any medication and be diagnosed with schizophrenia, then what in the hell can't you get well from? Right. So, but to me, it's like, I mean, you, you can ask a lot of people, you're going to get a lot of different points of view, but my, my observation is what is psychosis and, and how do you get well from it? I mean, the best way to get well from psychosis first is just follow a few basic patterns. Don't take antipsychotic drugs. Stay the hell out of the hospital. Don't let a psychiatrist get their hands on you. Uh, be around people who are healthy. Figure out how to regulate your sleep cycle. Get people who listen to you, even if it's wacky shit that you're talking about. Get people who are supportive. Be in a figure out something that's useful to be productive. A lot of and. But it's very, very complicated, this stuff. Be in one sense, it's the opposite of the simple stuff I was saying. Because to me, what I've observed, what is psychosis? I mean, granted, there are some biological things. Sometimes people can be taking hallucinogenic drugs and can go psychotic. Or they can have a brain tumor, which is making them psychotic. Or they can have epilepsy, which is making them psychotic. But I'm talking about what's conventionally described as schizophrenia. Now, not all the biological psychosis stuff, but schizophrenia as a psychological condition. And what it is, is it's very early, early childhood trauma that's erupting. It's no longer being held in a dissociated part of the person's personality where it's not out. Instead, the, the wall of psychological defenses that's keeping all those early, early childhood traumas at bay, we're talking childhood traumas of babyhood kind of stuff, one year maybe, this stuff starts to erupt, it's, but it's coming out through an adult lens. And when it starts to come out, it, it's translated through an adult lens. And we don't, as adults, look at other, it just, it, it doesn't seem at all rational. And it's called out of reality. Well, the thing is, when a, when a little baby starts screaming and freaking out and having imaginary friends and hearing voices and yelling and walking around and playing with dolls and saying weird shit, well, they're just being a little kid. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's there's room for us to look at a little kid who has imaginary friends and talks to himself and sings to an imaginary toy and stuff like that. There's room for us to say, well, that's just a child being a child. He'll get he'll grow out of it. When the person does that as an adult, the exact same stuff, it's viewed as psychotic. This is not normal. This is unhealthy. This is a biological genetic condition. This is a diagnosable mental disorder. We need to give this person drugs so they won't hear voices, so they won't talk to themselves, so they won't be bizarre anymore. And yet, really, it's the exact same thing as that, that little kid is going through. It's just coming out through an adult lens, through a lot more intellect, and through a big person's body and a big person's more adult mind. And so the basic way to get rid of psychosis for a person is to take those traumas and somehow get rid of them. And there's two ways to do that. One way is to work through all those traumas. And if the person can work through all those traumas, especially those early traumas, they're not going to be psychotic anymore. They're not going to be schizophrenic. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. And so there are some programs and there are definitely, uh, I have no lack of examples of people that I know who have worked through a lot of their traumas and their psychosis goes away and it ain't ever coming back because there's no more of those early traumas to be pushed through the adult lens. There's, there's really nothing left in the person that's psychotic. Right. Now, the other way to heal from psychosis, to make the psychosis go away, is to take all those traumas and to push them back down and to rebuild that little wall over them. Right. Do you follow what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, presumably, for example, with drugs, I guess. Drugs can help, except they're not very good at it. Right. Because they have so many side effects, and a lot of times they're just not very good at taking those traumas and pushing them down. One other way can be 
doing intensive family therapy. I've seen it where people can do intensive family therapy. They go back into their family. They discuss all sorts of stuff. It's like doing chiropractic, uh, you know, doing chiropractic stuff for a family, readjusting the family system in a way that the person can't tolerate having their psychosis be out there. And it, and it often can very quickly go back down and the person can lose all their bunker stuff. I think personally that to some degree, this is what's happening in the program in the world right now that's getting, it's the most famous program in the world for helping people with psychosis. It's in Northern Finland. It's, it's um, in a place called Tornio and they do intensive family therapy. They do a lot of really good stuff, but I think that, What's going on psychologically in this program is they're changing the way the family system operates that puts a lot of psychological pressure on the person experiencing psychosis to have their psychosis go back down, go behind that wall, and, and kind of get dissociated again. Right. And they're having the best results in the world. They're getting 85% full recovery without medication right. in this program. And it's, it's stunning that they can do those results. In a strange way, it gives people the chance to get their life back and decide what they want to do. But in a way, they're using the families that actually, I think, had a major part in causing the psychosis to help the person get well from it. And sometimes it's not, it's not always that simple. Sometimes the families grow also and they become healthier and some of their ways of dealing with each other become less fucked up so they don't trigger psychosis again in people. But I think just because someone gets well from psychosis doesn't really tell about the inner dynamics of how they're getting well. Are, are they pushing their traumas down and walling them off and getting rid of psychosis that way? Or are they actually working through their traumas and really fully healing through it? And those can be very, very different. And so that's sort of what I've been observing with different people, different programs. And certainly the easier way is to help somebody push the psychosis down. It can happen a lot more quickly. Mm. I think the working through the traumas generally takes longer and it's much more intensive well it strikes me that there is a parallel in people who in in people who don't have you know who aren't diagnosed with schizophrenia but who uh who want to reassess their family relationships and who have the pain of trauma from the past coming up that you know one of two things can happen they can either really really get in there and and look at some of the most painful stuff, uh, which often thoroughly disrupts the family system, and I would say probably always thoroughly disrupts the family system. Yep. Yep. Um, or they can, you know, they can kind of raise a little bit and get some accommodation um, from their family system enough that it's enough to settle those things back into being stuff that you sort of take for granted or don't don't necessarily. Uh, you're not necessarily conscious of again and maybe that's the sort of maybe yep. that's the similarity that we can learn from from looking at the sort of extreme cases is that that's two ways that it can go when you try and try and heal from from your traumas yeah i think that's nicely said and i think that and i've observed that also that people when this this family stuff starts to come up and they start to feel a lot of rage they go to their families when they really go on the process to fully work it out especially when the family is not really into going on this process too which mostly they aren't that the end result is it creates havoc in the family and often the person has to leave the family hmm. the second thing is and i think you said it is when the, the stuff comes out and some things happen but i think a lot of times what happens is it becomes so overwhelming for the person that they're feelings are coming out that they end up just forgiving their parents yeah and and when they forgive it all their feelings kind of go down it gets walled off again and they feel healthy and normal and they feel like they've worked through it yeah. they're no they're no longer an angry teenager now they're a mature adult i've learned how to forgive my family you know it's really i've come to a better place now we have a mature relationship we deal with each other as adults you know i really love them they love me yeah we had some problems in the past but we now really mutually respect each other yeah and now i feel ready to have kids myself yeah, exactly. It's the, you know what, we've had some problems, but I'm going to be the bigger person here. Yep. I'm an adult now and I'm going yep. to, you know, yeah, everyone's got their faults. I can see my parents not as, a, you know, ideal people, but then again, you know, everyone's human. So we've yep. had a talk about it and now it's all going to go, you know, then it all get, it gets dampened down again.
Yes, and it's so funny because that being the bigger person, that was the theme of my childhood. I was always the bigger person. I was, I was a master at forgiving them, loving them, seeing them for why they did what they did, understanding them in context, realizing that they had difficult lives, seeing how much pain they were in. Yes, I know my dad hit me sometimes and was a piece of shit to me, but you know, I know deep down he really, really loved me and he was just acting out and I really forgive him and I really feel good about myself for that. And I certainly got loved for it, for being so forgiving. And yeah, my mom was an alcoholic and was a drug addict and was fucked up and was perverted and definitely had horrible sexual boundaries with me. But, you know, she didn't really mean it that much. And that was not who she really was. And it was just a small part of my childhood. And deep down, she really loved me. And she was definitely the best influence in my life that I have. And I forgive her, blah, 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 bunch of crap. That, that's how I survived my childhood. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know I had exactly the same approach myself. And, and, I think, uh, and I think both you and I got to a point where that approach became untenable. Uh, yeah. And but for a lot of people, um, you know, it does it does actually you, you can live a life like that. You can live a whole life like that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's uh, untenable. Yeah, I wanted something more. And I think once I had a real chance to become free, much more free, all that forgiveness started to go away really quick. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time. It's been fascinating, Daniel. We've, oh, yeah. Thanks a lot, Jake. This is cool. We talked about, um, you know, lots of great, great stuff. And I want to make sure that people can find more um, resources to do with your writing and the things, your, your thoughts. So could you uh, just uh, give me the URL for your, for your website? Sure. www.irarsoul.com. I-R-A-R-E-S-O-U-L.com. Awesome. And you also have a YouTube channel, which I'm sure people can find through the... Uh, through the um, through your website, yeah, I think just if you, I think if you just Google my name, Daniel Mackler, everything sort of comes up. But it's D Mackler fifty eight. I think that's my YouTube channel. I'm thinking of changing all those names. I'm sick of like the soul word in there. It's because it's like I don't even use that word in conversation. Right. So well, you, I'm di- sure you'll have a redirect if you do change it, so people. Will yeah, I think. It. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll, you can tell me more about this because I'm, I'm kind of uh, internet clueless. <laughs> And also, you know, I hope that you put your songs on uh, uh, on YouTube at some stage because I've got them, but uh, you've done some really great stuff. And uh, oh, which ones are you referring to? I'm referring to the two albums that you did of your music. Oh, really? Yeah, I have to think about that. I don't know what I'm doing. <sighs> I've got so many so many things ahead. <laughs> thanks again, Daniel, and thanks for taking part. This is great. Thank you, Jake.